glad we're able to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for being here and for sharing your story with me. I am yeah. so honored and privileged to be able to um, just sit here and hear your story. Yeah. It's special. Thank you. If you could go back to that place when you first started and you first found out about your infertility, um, tell us how old you were and how you, how you felt and just start there. Okay. So I guess to kind of start, um, give a little bit of history when I was 15 years old, um, I was having some issues, um, gastrointestinal issues, um, just not something wasn't quite right. So my mom took me to the doctor, um, the doctor palpated my abdomen and, um, she was like, is there any chance that you're pregnant? I said, no, there's not any chance. Um, and there wasn't. Um, so she was like, okay, well, I, um, would like to do a CT scan on you. And of course she ran a pregnancy test anyways, because, you know, to just kind of cover her own butt, which I understand. Um, but so I went in for the CT scan and they found a, um, large abdominal or sorry, an ovarian cyst. Um, and they said she, the reason she asked me if I was pregnant is because she, um, palpated my abdomen and thought I was four months pregnant. So um, just to kind of give you an idea of how large the ovarian cyst was. Um, so she went ahead and, you know, scheduled me for a surgical consult um, and they moved forward with surgery to remove that. Um, and while they were in there, you know, the doctor made the um, decision to go ahead and remove my ovary as well. Um, he said it was to prevent, um, the likelihood of it reoccurring. So, um, you know, of course my, I always knew I wanted children. So starting then I was like, was it, is that going to affect my, you know, likelihood of having children? He said, no, you'll be fine. You know, you have a million eggs, you know, and you have another ovary, you'll be fine. And so, um, you know, I always in the back of my mind thought that that would be an issue, but I had regular periods. Um, I wasn't, I didn't have any abnormalities um, after that was removed because um, that was another thing. I was having some mis irregular periods um, and that kind of prompted the going to the doctor as well for that. So um, moving forward to um, when my husband and I got married, um, I was 21 years old. Um, we He was 27 at the time. Um, so we had two nieces, ages three and four. We knew that we wanted to have our children close in age to them, if at all possible, just so that we could have, you know, that closeness and uh, we're very close to our families anyways. So um, we started trying, um, or I should say we just were not preventing, we weren't using any con um, contraception or anything. Um, or, yeah. Um, so we we're going on trying for about a year um, and still nothing. Um, so in 2016, so that was in 20, 2014. So in 2016, um, I thought that I was pregnant, but um, it just came up. The test was negative, although I was, you know, I had like the tender breasts and, you know, just kind of the weird, like really tired and everything. So, um, when I took the pregnancy test, I, it turns out it was negative, but I did have like a heavier period afterwards. So I'm not sure if there, if it just didn't take, you know, at that time I was just yeah. like, well, maybe I was pregnant and I had a early, early miscarriage, you know, miscarriage. So, um, it was a difficult time, um, at that time, two years into our marriage and still no progress with our family, um, planning and everything. Um, at that time, you know, we were seeing a lot of pregnancy announcements or birth announcements. So that was kind of tough. Um, and so that also was when I started seeing more people sharing their infertility stories or their difficult, their journeys um, through infertility. And so that kind of opened my eyes to the um, platforms of Instagram and um, Facebook where, you know, people were sharing those journeys and kind of made me realize like I wasn't alone. We weren't alone in this. And so, um, that I think really helped, um, kind of starting to explore those, um, those people and those different things like the hashtags, you know, um, that kind of fit with our journey. So 
Um, October of 2016, I went to my OBGYN and they did blood work, um, a pelvic exam and everything um, looked good on that end. So she recommended that my husband um, have a sperm analysis done or semen analysis done. Um, so we did, and um, they referred him to the, a urologist for that. And so we had that done and um, came back that there was low sperm count and motility, as well as some morphology issues as well. And um, upon exam, a varicocele. So um, a lot of things kind of stacking up against us in that manner. Um, the, the urologist decided to go ahead and start him on Clomid to see if um, that would help with his sperm count. Um, so we tried that from January, um, February, I'm sorry, February of 2017 to August of 2017. And they rechecked the semen analysis and not much change happened. Mm -hmm. So also he was, one of the side effects of that medication is a um, increased or a high hemoglobin level. And so, um, he actually had elevated hemoglobin. So he had to go donate blood um, to kind of fix that. Otherwise it can cause stroke. So um, we decided to discontinue that medication um, and see they referred us to the fertility specialist or the reproductive and in, sorry. Um, yeah, we it's all a know big that word. word. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> endocrinologist. <laughs> yes. So um, we, had an appointment with them and started, we saw them in um, October of 2017 is when we started kind of with our first consult with them. Um, they presented our options. Currently, I was still under my parents' insurance, um, which actually covered 80% of um, infertility treatments. So it was wow. huge. Yeah. Um, a huge blessing. Um, and that's kind of why we decided to go ahead and move forward with everything um, too, and kind of explore that, our options uh, more seriously. So I, they kind of laid out our options with my husband's issues and um, with, you know, my one ovary, they were thinking um, intrauterine insemination kind of wouldn't be our best option, might kind of waste some more time um, than be and not be successful as opposed to IVF. So um, we went ahead and again, because of my the insurance coverage, we were, uh, we just went ahead and went with the IVF and jumped over um, the IUI option. Um, so November, I went in for the um, saline infusion sonohistogram and everything looked good there. January, I started um, my medications, January of 2018 and um, for IVF or for the, our first um, yeah, egg retrieval. And we got 13 eggs. Um, they did kind of say they looked kind of grainy, um, but you know, they were, they were happy with the number considering I only had one or one, yeah, one ovary. Um, but as the days progressed after fertilizing, um, the numbers just started dropping off very quickly on um, viable embryos. So ended up with only one, um, it wasn't even an embryo yet. It was in a blastocyst stage. It was the stage right before that. Um, but our plan was to do a fresh transfer. And the doctor said, you know, if you want to go ahead and move forward with this, we can still transfer it and see if that will if it'll be a viable pregnancy. So we went ahead and decided to transfer that. Um, and we unfortunately did not take. Um, so kind of went back to um, our drawing or, you know, just kind of reevaluating everything. So the doctor recommended waiting two months afterwards to kind of give my uterus, you know, time to um, heal or, and also um, my ovaries to, the to kind of the inflammation and everything or just the stimulation because I did have some a very low grade amount of the um, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome I believe that's what yeah. the word is I oh, kind of forget it. yeah you got it yeah yeah so um so yeah I she wanted to take a break and just kind of let my body revert kind of go back to normal a little bit give it some time 
So in May of 2018, we did our second embryo or IVF um, egg retrieval, so IVF cycle, and we got another 13 eggs. <laughs> um, seemed to be a number for us, um, but uh, again, we only got one viable egg, and this time it was or embryo, so this time it was an actual embryo that we got. Um, and she wanted to do a frozen transfer this time. So give my body again, some time, a break before we started back into, you know, transfer. So we did that. And in June, we transferred and um, it was, it didn't um, take. Uh, so we were kind of back to the drawing board, you know, what's going on, why I, I think at that point, that was when she kind of was like, you know, I think you have diminished ovarian reserve. Mm. It's not really that common, younger women. Um, but, you know, I think that's, you know, what we're dealing with just because of the quality of my eggs was not good. She said they were kind of the quality of a 40 year old um, mm. woman. So that was hard to hear. Um, mm. Just kind of, I don't know, just trying to understand, you know, why, am I, you know, I'm very young. I shouldn't be having this issue. Right. Um, it was just kind of frustrating because it was hard not to look back at that 15 year old um, experience, you know, that surgery I had and be like, well, would I be in the same situation if I didn't have right. um, that surgery? But who knows, you know? Yeah. So throughout all of this, you know, my husband and I had been talking about adoption. Are we, you know, are we ready for that? Are we, do we want to keep pursuing at that time it just made more sense to keep going um, with IVF financially because it was covered so much of it was um, as opposed to you know paying for a home study and all this other you know um, the adoption itself so I have a question um, for you yeah so absolutely. because you're in Indiana is that correct mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and we, where we lived, when we did IVF, we, or, well, I think it's, it's where we lived in the South and, um, the coverage, we, we just didn't have any coverage. We had to pay out of pocket for everything. Mm -hmm. So I'm yeah. just curious, um, how do they allow like a certain amount of cycles? What were like the regulations? Could you just keep on going? What did that look like? Yeah, I think. I don't remember exactly, but I do believe it was like they covered, um, I think it was three cycles or three IVF um, cycles and then um, the transfers, I think it was three with each one or something like that. So um, we did have to pay like out of pocket um, for certain things, certain procedures. Um, and medications. Uh, some of our medications were covered, but not all of them. So um, that part we did have to pay out of pocket. And then, yeah, there was, um, I think it was like a facility fee every time that we went down there, excuse me, and did a transfer. There was a facility fee that um, our insurance didn't cover. It was just an out of pocket charge for the facility, for the um, clinic that we were, went to, that we went to, so. Okay. Okay, yeah. so they gave you those three, and I'm assuming mm -hmm. after that, then it's on your own. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of what we were dealing with. And again, it, we were grateful that we had that for sure, um, yeah. that coverage. In August of 2018, um, that's when we were encouraged to look at um, their options, whether it be a surrogate. Um, sperm donor and egg donor, um, or also, you know, embryo adoption. Our clinic specifically did not really have a whole lot of um, eggs or embryos in their bank in there uh, to, for us to choose from really, uh, just because they had a smaller amount of, I guess, clients that had chosen that option. Um, and so again, we kind of didn't really think about that as being an option for us at that time, just because of, you know, looking into the home study and um, just it would take more time to, um, and we were kind of on a time crunch. My, the insurance, you know, ran out on me for in July of 2019. So um, we were kind of trying to get all this done before that time ran out um, so that we could be covered as much as possible. And so 
we had discussed, you know, my husband getting the surgery to correct the varicocele and see if we could, you know, use his sperm in my, in, again, and see if that was the issue or if it were, were my egg quality. Um, there's just a lot of unknowns. I think we all understand yeah. when uh, going through this process, but it's kind of frustrating, but you know, we just don't always know the exact reason why or what it is, uh, what variable is not working. So um, we kind of discussed, you know, what, how we would feel if one of a, we used a donor for whether it be the egg or the sperm and not for the other one for the other, um, how we would feel as parents if, you know, not being a part of one of us was a part of our child and the other wasn't. So we decided to use both of the egg, egg donor and a sperm donor. Um, and again, it was just a better option for us at that time. And I feel like what we wanted, what was best for us. So we looked through the catalog of <laughs> different uh, websites of, um, you know, the sperm donors and picked one out. That was kind of an odd experience, um, kind of like a dating profile. You're looking over, like, what are your interests? Well, you know, what is your family <laughs> like? And all this other stuff. So it was really strange, um, especially being like, you know, you want someone, you're looking at their physical, um, you know, characteristics as well. So it just kind of felt strange, to be honest. Um, being a married woman, you know, you're kind of like, well, I mean, that's a good looking guy. You know, he might have a... <laughs> good I don't know it's, it's just a very strange situation I'm sure so, I'm sure yeah um so that was but that was pretty quick um for us to both decide and then when it came to the egg donors that was more difficult um we gave our we looked through our catalog that our clinic had um because they used you know from Indiana they used donors there um, and she, rec our doctor recommended um, that we do a fresh uh, retrieval for the egg retrieval, just because the likelihood of the eggs being fertilized was greater than if you had used frozen eggs. Um, okay. So that was what she had recommended. So we went again, went with that. Our first one was currently in a cycle um, and we wanted to see if she would be willing to do a cycle afterwards, but she uh, was not available for that. Our second option, um, we had requested her and she backed out. She initially said yes, and then backed out due to family issues. Um, our third option didn't respond at all. And then we gave our three more options just all together. We're like, let's just see if any of them are available and none of them responded. <laughs> so then our, um, the person that was kind of working with us, um, the consultant that was working with us on this, she was like, I've never had this issue, you know, matching a couple with a donor this much before. And so Zach, my husband and I were kind of like, well, what is going on? Why are we, you know, being, uh, I don't know, just, told no uh, several times, you know, why is this being so difficult? Um, finally, they kind of came back with us in November and said, hey, we have another, we have someone who's not yet listed on our site. Um, she just got cleared for, an, a, you know, to be a donor. Um, are you interested in her? Here's her profile. So we looked at her and we said, yes, let's, you know, we're interested. Um, and she said she was available right away. So they started the medications and she um, was supposed to go in in November for the egg retrieval. However, on her way to the appointment, she was in a car accident and her car caught on fire. What? We're like, what in the world is going on? And she was okay. She was fine, safe, which we were, you know, happy to hear. Um, but they were like, she was like, if I can still come in and donate, you know, I will. But it was too far, you know, she had missed that time, um, little time frame. you know, that's, that's kind of a crucial, you're limited on your time frame when you are donating, you're going through that rig retrieval. So they said, you know, unfortunately we can't do this cycle, um, do it, retrieve this cycle. So we'll have to try again. Um, 
she was fortunately willing to do it again. And um, even though our doctor was kind of came back with us afterwards and was like, you know, before you want to move forward with her again, I do want to let you know I wasn't thrilled with the number of eggs or follicles that she had. Um, she didn't respond as nicely as we had hoped. Um, and this being her first cycle, they didn't know how she would have responded or was going to respond and everything. Okay, so, so I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. you, okay, so when the when your clinic is looking at these women, are these women going in with the idea of helping individuals like yourself? Okay. Yeah, so yes, they do get compensated for, um, for being donors. Um, I don't remember exactly the amount. I wanna say it's around 5,000 um, for each cycle. So it's a significant um, compensation that they get. Um, but yeah, they, I mean, they say, you know, that's what their drive is to, and like, at least in their profile, um, the one that we had chosen to was like, you know, I just really want to help. I've been blessed to have my own children and I want to help other okay. women be able to have their own families. So, um, yeah, so that's their, they, yeah, they go in and they have to go through all these, this testing and everything, questionnaires, psychological, um, psychological evaluations and things like that. So okay. they are screened for, yeah, absolutely. So um, they weren't thrilled with the number of a, a follicles that she had, but uh, we were, we had had so much trouble finding a donor to begin with. And um, we were, you know, finally really excited about this donor. So we went ahead and asked her to donate again and, or do a cycle again. And she said she would. So in January of 2019, um, she had an egg, the egg retrieval done uh, successfully <laughs> and they uh, fertilized the eggs and we were left with four embryos. Um, I wanted to mention when we were first, my husband and I were first starting to, um, you know, talk about our kids' names and everything way back when we first started dating and everything. Um, we had only come to agreement on one and it was Jaden, J-A-D-Y or J-A-Y-D-E-N, but we were going to spell it, you know, change the spelling depending on the gender. Cause we liked that name for both genders. And so, um, the egg retrieval and fertilization actually happened during winter storm Jaden here in Indiana. So it was, that was just kind of a neat little um, coincidence or if you, that's God wink, if you want to call it that too. <laughs> um, and so that's what we thought at the time too. We're like, whoa, maybe this is, maybe this is it, you know? And so we, during, I also wanted to mention during the whole egg donor process, searching for that, they did run blood work on me again. Um, more closely looking at, you know, um, coagulation time or um, issues, things like that, um, recurring pregnancy loss. So like a fertility screening panel that was current, uh, it was very relatively new. I think it had come out within six months of that at that time that kind of just screened for, um, to see if you're genetically, um, it looked at your genetics, I should say, to see if you're um, going to have recurrent pregnancy issues or things like that. And I actually came back um, with positive or I did test for recurrent pregnancy loss, as well as they diagnosed me with lupus anticoagulant syndrome, which is um, basic, it's not lupus, uh, the disease lupus, but it's, okay. it has to do with your blood clotting. And therefore, when you're when the embryo is trying to attach to the uterine lining, your blood, um, the blood supply to that actually ends up clotting and that causes miscarriage. So you, okay. um, yeah, so that is partly, I think what was part of the issue um, underlying too. The solution to that, to kind of help, you know, treat that or 
um, prevent that from happening is to be on a um, anticoagulant injection. So I was on um, a heparin or I can't remember the name of it, it, it but it was a Lupron or not Lupron. Anyways, it was, it was so in a many. daily injection. I know. And you would think being on it for so long, I would remember. Um, but basically it was a daily injection that you had to do. And so she, my doctor was like, well, let's, you know, for your next transfer, we'll try putting you on this and, um, but we'll wait until we get a positive pregnancy test and then we'll start it. We did the first transfer with the donor embryo in, I believe it was March and it was failed. Um, and that's when the doctor, you know, recommended switching to, as soon as I had the transfer, starting that anticoagulant injection. And so we had another transfer the following month and again, it failed. Um, so, but we, I did actually get a pregnancy, positive pregnancy test at that point. Um, we didn't know it was going to fail. Um, it was, we made it to the like five week um, ultrasound. My numbers were slowly rising. Um, it was, I think I was at 16, I think was my beta. Um, so just barely positive uh, or just not very high at all. Um, and she was actually kind of concerned about it being a fallopian uh, pregnancy or that it had ectopic. to travel. To, yes, thank you, ectopic. Mm -hmm. um, and so she was monitoring my levels very closely in the upcoming days. And we made it to the five week ultrasound. There was a yolk sac, but there was nothing um, inside. Um, so she said, you know, maybe it's still kind of early. We can continue with medications and see if it does, you know, if there, if it does progress at all, if it is viable. So we opted to do that, uh, continue for another week and see if the embryo or if the fetus can develop. Um, and unfortunately it did not. Um, so at that time we were kind of left waiting for me to have a miscarriage. Um, mm. I actually, at that time, my husband, it was in July. Um, I, I had went on vacation with my husband's parents and his brother and his brother's girlfriend. So it was kind of a family vacation without my husband because my husband was, um, he was taking our youth group. He's a youth pastor. So he was taking our youth group on a mission trip to Puerto Rico. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, so um, to help with the hurricane relief um, at that time. So we were apart and it just so happened that I ended up having my miscarriage um, finish out uh, in while I was on vacation without him. And that was, that was pretty difficult. Um, it was hard being apart for that. And we knew it was coming, but we just didn't know when, you know. It, um, so it was, hard for him not being there but I think it also kind of made us stronger you know and just I don't know we had to just be thankful for each other and what we had and everything so yeah. anyways um we after that um we were just kind of like we had two embryos left um just kind of sitting where are we at you know we're so do we want to do two more transfers? Do we want to do one more transfer? Um, and we had decided that we would just transfer the last two embryos and do one more. And then, um, you know, try to, then we would be done with IVF and move on to adoption. You know, that would be it for us. Um, throughout this whole process, you know, grieving was a huge, it was like, it seemed like it was always, something more that you were grieving over, um, whether it be a dream, you know, or the thoughts that you would have, um, what your children would look like if they would have your features or his, or, you know, all those things, um, which I'm sure we've all, um, you know, processed or went, at least had those thoughts um, throughout our journeys. And it's just, this was another thing like, okay, it was just a final, 
I guess the finalization or just seemed to finalize things for us. Like, mm -hmm. this is it. This is our last shot. Um, so after my miscarriage, I didn't have a DNC or anything. I did pass, you know, what I believe was all the tissue. Um, and so they said, okay, well, whenever we waited two months and um, to see if just give my body time to heal and then we would do our final transfer and I didn't stop bleeding for I think it was about five weeks I finally got my period um I think it was around two or three months after my miscarriage and mm -hmm. at that point it would not it didn't stop um it was just pretty heavy and just abnormal for me um and it, like I said it went on for about five weeks and finally the doctor was like I think we need to do a, um, a, a hysterectomy or hysterectomy, a hysteroscopy. hysteroscopy. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. And so I went in for that and they did find a polyp um, in my uterus that um, she removed. And afterwards, you know, she was like, I think we're okay. I think everything else looked good. Now that we removed that polyp, you know, we'll just wait for you to start your period one more time. Um, and then we can do the transfer. So in January of 2020, um, we went in for our transfer of our last two embryos and we finally got a positive, um, beta in February. So, um, that was still so scary for us, you know, just after everything, like all of us, I, I know we've all been there, um, just waiting for the beta to rise and see if it's, you know, if we're in the clear. I don't think it ever leaves you that anxiety or that worry, um, even through pregnancy, you know, you're worried, is this gonna, is this, am I gonna make it to the next week or the next trimester even, you know, it just kind of, um, it's always anxious, anxiety, but it's always there, but, um, it did rise and it looked much better than the last time. It still was, they were still kind of low as I compared them, of course, to other people's that I was seeing post, um, their numbers. And of course you're always like, oh, my numbers aren't, aren't as good as theirs. Is this going to work? Um, but we were blessed to have, um, a good, you know, pretty uneventful, pregnancy um, and our daughter was born in October. So um, we're, we were thrilled to have that and we named her Jaden. Um, the uh, one thing that kind of we found out later on um, after winter storm Jaden and all this other stuff, um, the God winks there, we decided to just look up the name and see what it actually stands for. And it actually means God has heard and so then wow. we we're just like, okay, this is, it's just amazing. Yeah. Just wow. another God wink. <laughs> um, yeah. So then we're like, well, we can't change your name now. <laughs> it has to be exactly. changed. Not that we were considering it, but um, yeah, it's just throughout all of that, it was so difficult to stay positive. A lot of times I you know I yelled at God so many times. Um, I was so angry and sad and frustrated. Um, I didn't understand why I had such a, such a strong desire to become a mother and be able to experience pregnancy and, um, you know, carrying my child. Um, I didn't know why I had that desire if I wasn't going to be able to have that, you know, um, yeah. And I, now I know that God had other plans and, you know, I can't imagine my life without Jaden, you know, I can't imagine her being a different child, you know, I guess, yeah. um, of course, I always wonder what those other embryos would have been, you know, what children they would have become. Um, but again, I know that God has a plan for everything and, uh, I don't know how many times people told me that throughout the journey, our journey and how irritating I got, <laughs> irritated I got at that. Like, yeah. okay, I know it doesn't make things easier for by any means. Um, but I, at the same time, you do know that you're, that's right. You know, that it's true. Um, God does have a plan for everything and his timing is great. Um, right. if I had, if that pregnancy had come to full term, um, when I had my, before I had a miscarriage, you know, that one, 
we would have been having a baby right at the beginning of all of this COVID and everything. And I don't know what that would have looked like or anything. So um, yeah, it's just interesting to look back and see all that. So for sure. Wow. What a journey that you have been on. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Gosh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's hard. It is so hard, no matter the diagnosis, no matter what you're facing in infertility. And it looks so different. Mm-hmm. It can look so different for everyone. Um, yeah. And it's, it's a difficult road. Um, mm-hmm. Did your friends or did your family know, like when you were vacationing with them, when you had your miscarriage, did they know what was going on? Um, yeah, they did. Um, they were, we were very open with our whole process. Uh, initially, we tried to be quiet about it. Um, but then it was just with appointments all the time and everything, it just became really difficult to hide it. And honestly, it was so much better mentally and emotionally for me to be open about it um, as instead of trying to battle this or go through it alone, you know, isolating yeah. myself. Um, yeah. So they did know, um, you know, we told them that we that it had failed or um, that we were having a miscarriage and um, we weren't sure when we would be, able, when it would actually final, you know, end up happening, I guess, when I would pass um, everything, but yeah. it just happened to be with them. And, you know, they were very supportive. They tried to make the best of the trip before it actually happened and everything, you know, and just trying to get, allow me to be able to relax and kind of rejuvenate, even though I was battling with this emotionally and um, yeah. physically too. Um, but yeah, they were very supportive and um, I appreciate, I'm thankful that they were there. That's so good. I think it makes a world of a difference doing this alone or doing mm-hmm. it with just people who just know and who can be there mm-hmm. for your support. Um, if there's one thing you could go back before you started this journey that you wish some, maybe something you knew, you know, maybe that's something that you could go back and tell yourself, would that be, would there be anything that you would say? Um, the doctor warned us, you know, that IVF can be very, um, taxing emotionally and physically and financially. And I think I, I thought I understood that, but I definitely, you know, you just don't really know how you can prepare for it until you're, you're in it. I feel like, you know, you, you can try to prepare for it as much as you can, but once you're there, you don't really know how, how you're going to react to certain news or things like that. So I guess just, um, be open to, um, curveballs and try to you know I try to roll with the punches and everything with that um yeah it's so hard to know what to expect but um not only that but also just be patient um god god is he loves you and he has he, he has a great plan for you um even though you don't see it right now and you don't understand it um one day you will so yeah and sometimes that's that is so good like that means so much more in that moment in that dark Mm -hmm. moment when you have nowhere to turn and and you are just feeling so heavy Mm -hmm. sometimes those words are just like all you need to get through that moment or that day Mm -hmm, um if you know, if somebody who is watching this is going through or considering egg, the egg donation or embryo adoption or being, or getting a sperm donor, is there any advice that you would give them? Don't rush it. You know, don't feel like you have to, um, make a quick decision. Um, you know, take your time and, um, if, uh, if you can, (laughs) um, and just kind of, explore your options. I just don't also, I guess I put a lot of thought into how am I going to feel, you know, explaining this to my child, um, and just trying to make her understand why we chose this. And, 
um, why, you know, that she is loved, you know, and it's not that her donors didn't want her at all, you know, by any means, it was um, that they were willing to help her and her dad um, create um, a child for us to love. And so I guess kind of, you can consider that too, and don't look at it as you're not gonna be able to um, make an impression or have, you know, even though you're not DNA, you're, she's, they're not your DNA, um, they're still yours and it doesn't make you any less of a parent um, because of that. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. A lot of, a lot of good stuff here. Thank you so much, Danielle. Thank you for You're just, welcome. you know, being open. This is a very, um, you know, it, a lot of people choose not to talk about it. And I think there's healing that comes from talking about it and not that one way is right or, or wrong. We all handle it differently, but, um, I, and I, and I think it's for those who are watching this, who are going through very similar steps as you have, it's, it's super helpful. It's super helpful because I think it's hard to find this stuff that people are willing to share. So thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate you, yeah. um, you know, being open with your story as well and opening this platform for others to share their stories. Um, I decided that, you know, if I'm going through this, God has me going through it for a reason. And, um, I wanted to be able to share it if I could, um, with whoever is going through similar things and, um, just to give them hope and, um, light in their time of darkness. And so that's kind of what I've tried to do as well is be open and uh, make the best of our journey and be a witness, um, that God is good through it all. And so that's so good. That's so good. I know that speaks to so many hearts too.